All right, so I hit record in the hopes that folks who may have missed this have an opportunity to listen to what we uh, share as we, we move forward. And um, so this particular one is uh, was interesting for me. So folks who don't know, I'm Satu Dene, and that means that my people are from Treaty 11. And uh, what I find interesting about reading this book specifically, it really talks about um, once the Canadian government figured out they could exploit uh, the land, that was when they decided to finally do treaty with Treaty 8 and, and 11, because they knew that there were um, economic benefits for them exploiting that land. So of course they made treaty. And so I found it really interesting just reading that part. Um, another far, part that I found very interesting was the idea that um, how much influence it wasn't really the Canadian government. The Canadian government had written off um, that area really specifically until they figured out they could generate wealth from it. But up to that point, it was actually the Church of England and Rome, the Church of Rome, that had the most influence and sway of that area because that was who was in charge were the Christian churches, not necessarily the Canadian government. So, and the Canadian government was doing everything they could to not, um, you know, take any responsibility, especially financially, for what was happening to the Indigenous youth being forced to um, attend these residential schools. And then I found it really interesting how the Métis parents wanted their kids to partake. And it was actually the churches that were encouraging them to identify as First Nation instead of Métis. So back to what Kathy was saying about different definitions according to which jurisdiction of university. Um, you know, I, I actually was really upset by the narrative that's currently out there about who is and who isn't Métis, because where I come from, the First Nation <clears throat> and Métis are very much linked together. And my daughter, if she does get denied Indian status, uh, will automatically qualify as Yellowknife um, Métis because they qualify anybody who was originally Dene and having that background as Métis if they don't qualify for First Nation status. So this whole, if you're not Red River, you're not Métis conversation, I find very uh, problematic and hurtful to the rest of the country that has folks who, if they're English, may identify as half-breed or if they're French as lineage um, in that way as well. So it, it's a really um, hard conversation to have with people because I find that the uh, Métis nationalists get so indignant about this conversation and I disagree with it, but a lot of settlers are like, well, this person said, so I'm going to listen to them. And it's like, mm but then that excludes the majority of the Indigenous. So, you know, it's a really hard conversation to have with folks. And uh, because I'm from the North and I've had these conversations within my community, I find um, the conversation down here in the South is just, it's pointless to even try to engage. So I actually have like some of the prominent activists blocked and they have me blocked for the same reason. Cause I'm like, you guys don't have it right, but they want to speak for me and uh, they can't. So that's why partly too why I have the podcast was like, well, if these people are prominently going to speak about these issues, I will too. And it was really clear in this book about that uh, conversation. So that's why I bring it up for folks who got the chance to read it. Um, and so just to clarify my, um, so I'm Satu Dene, obviously my family is Satu Dene. And I had the conversation with them. Well, what, because in Yellowknife, especially we have like, the Métis, Inuit, and First Nations are all together all the time. Like there's not the huge distinction, especially that you see down here. Um, and that's obviously because the Blackfoot were like, if you're Métis, we're running you out um, up until re more recently. So, you know, whereas up like in Cree country and then further north um, in more Dene country, we have a lot more of that, um, you know, uh, constant working together. So, Anyway, I, I just finally asked my aunt, I'm like, well, what the hell? Like, cause I, I didn't understand um, the different distinct nations at the time I asked her this question. And I asked her, well, what is the difference between Dene and Inuit? Because we were so 
embedded together that I didn't really quite understand. Um, and uh, she just said basically language, culture, and tree line to me. And, um, you know, so that was my understanding of the difference between me and my Inuit cousins for the longest time. And um, so I find it really interesting, you know, reading this book because it's really triggering for me to talk about how, you know, where I come from, we don't really distinct a lot with this whole Metis Inuit Dene conversation because we're just all brothers, sisters, um, cousins together. And, um, you know, and, and then of course it's problematic because down south there's so many settlers that want to pan indigenize us. But up north, like where I'm from, when I'm up there, we're all together. And I really thought this this book kind of showed why to me in a in a really deeper way. So um, my my granny went to uh, Sacred Heart in uh, Indian Residential School. It's a Catholic one in uh, Fort Providence from 1935 to 1951. And then my two um, my one my aunt and my uncle. They both went to uh, Bomb Pass Hall in Fort Simpson in 1977, which was the year I was born here in Calgary. So um, yeah, so that's, I, I found uh, it's interesting kind of referencing these very places that my family has attended and also kind of triggering, but also triggering because down South, there's so much divisiveness about the conversation on First Nation Métis Inuit, whereas up North, it's just kind of, okay and normalized so anyway uh, those were just some initial reflections I had of reading parts of these books um, I, I don't know maybe we'll go Kathy Wendy Rosemary Shelley and Kat and we'll just kind of reflect on what we've read hi um, yeah just going on what you just finished saying I, I the one thing I noticed was because the as the great distances and and everybody having to go to school maybe that contributed to more to the unity among first nations people because they kept referring in the book to um you know to the the inuit um and the what did they call it the orphans and the destitute white children going to school together so i, I figure maybe that's why you guys are all more more together than we are down south because you know we all had our own schools to go to um and i, I just basically it, it made me pretty sad to think about how far and then you know reading about some of the kids that still tried to run away with really no mm -hmm. idea about how far they actually were from their homes like that's just so sad right i i can't i can't imagine going five years without seeing your family at all when you're that little um and and it was really i wish i could have got through more of the book but i only got through the first part of it but the fact that the education did them no good that they came out and they were they were useless at home, so to speak, and useless in the white world. So really all it did was take them away and torture them for five years or more. And, and it, it did them absolutely no good. And it, that's just uh, really sad. And I wish I would have had more time to finish the book, but uh, I don't know, it disappeared. I had it downloaded and then I went to, to read it and the other day and it disappeared. So I never got a chance to read for a whole day, but you know, I read Headscarves and Hyman, so <laughs> uh, I guess that was a good thing. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And um, Kathy, you picked up on one of the words that really stuck out for me too, like all that destitute and neglected language that they use um, throughout, like it just, I don't know, I had to pause every time there was a sentence using those words. I find them quite um, harsh labels for um, thinking about people and care. So I really just noticed that the absence of care, like every time I saw those words, I was just writing lots of um, <laughs> my own thoughts next to those of just um, that language of care being absent in anything that's uh, political discussion or state discussion, like it's just they want to wipe care right out of thought. And, and um, so that was really hard because I felt like no matter what um, 
race they were assigning next to those words, like they had really dehumanized anyone that they were putting in those categories. So that was a hard part for me, um, especially with the frequency um, that it kept coming up. Um, and, and certainly, you know, I, I think it stood out for me, all the rivalry between Protestants and Catholics um, as I was reading through. And um, that was probably, so I, I um, was raised Protestant and then had a few years of my schooling when I attended some Catholic schools. And I, I, I just didn't really understand that history um, over time, but I, it never made sense to me as a child. Like, um, just dividing up Protestants, Catholics, all within Christianity, there were still quite a lot of harshness and just demands on people to um, ostracize the other group. Um, so that I, I read a lot into that and, and just thought, um, you know, it's unfortunate that neither group seems to have the reflection moment for themselves that um, none of it seems very Christian, like their, their thoughts are really just um, meant to wield power. So um, those were some some big thoughts I had around that. And then I think the rest of my notes really um, were around what they they talked about with um, curricula. So kind of reflecting on the part where uh, kids didn't gain anything from this and um, those years of time away from their families. Like I, mm -hmm. I find it impossible to believe that many, many, many people who were running this didn't understand that that was wrong. Like it's wrong to be kept from your family, um, certainly for years at a time and certainly at that time of life. So that was hard. And then I, I reflected on it a little bit more because I was thinking a lot about why I was finding the language around education so upsetting. And, and so really just made some notes to myself along the lines of, um, that all the language in there around education, like none of that was the mindset of an educator. It was really um, mm -hmm. these, they're not thinking about learning. <laughs> they, they have a totally different outcome that they're looking for. Um, I, I found that there was one quote I wrote down where it said, getting the educational results we want, like, you know, that approach to educating a population, um, really doesn't speak to what educators think about and um, just really found it um, hard. And, and I think I've said this at some of our other discussions as well, like there's so many parallels to what we currently experience. And when we talk about curricula and we talk about what does it mean to educate children, um, I think that I found it really hard to read these pieces and realize like, education is about more than just the outcome. This is supposed to be enriching the lives of every person that's um, living their lives. And so I, I just found those to be really jumping out at me, especially when they said one in three of the teachers had no teaching certificate of any kind. It's just, um, there was just a lot there. And um, so that's why it took, took me quite a bit of time because I, I think those ideas I, I got a bit hung up on um, but also felt they were super important for right now because if we're talking about what do people gain um, from their education, it's really challenging when we only talk about how does this education make it easy to package up what kind of person this will be in society. Um, like it, it's so limiting and, and dehumanizing to think of people and, and learners like that. So those are the things I took away and, and certainly just um, helped enrich my understanding of the North because I, I don't have a deep understanding of that. Um, but I think the length of time away from family was the piece that really reminded me of the, of the distance that they were from their families. So thanks for the chance to talk about those reflections. Oh, I so appreciate it. And if you guys don't mind, I'll just kind of jump in here for a bit because um, both, both of you kind of talked about it so well. And um, there's this one chapter five about education for what purpose, and that starts on uh, page 45. And in it, like there was just so many quotes. I, I was just, I didn't even know how to talk about it with you all, because like they talk about that report of the education of Eskimo and des destitute orphan white children. Like, it's so funny, especially today when we talk about race relations with folks. 
and they're like, you know, why do you got to single out white people? And it's like, well, in 1934, you guys were already calling us, you know, um, uh, Eskimos and, and naming all of these names and such. And, um, you know, it, it, it's like dehuman, dehumanizing language in, in so many ways. And some of these quotes were so awful. And then I was reading this one about this RCMP official talking about um, how the kids were no good, like just above it, actually. So this is page 49. Um, you know, of course, after a Minds and Resources uh, memorandum on education in the Northwest Territories, written in 1939, concluded that the standards of education was not generally as high as the Indian schools throughout the provinces. The mission border boarding schools were not subject to any requirement to employment teachers having provincial qualifications, mm -hmm. uh, nor were there regular inspections of the schools. Um, and I don't know, I don't remember if I read it in here, but I know that my granny's um, residential school for Providence had burned down once by this time and they had to rebuild it. So that's why like she did attend that one. It did close in 1960, but um, you know, it had burnt down because, you know, and we've talked about this before in other book clubs about the lack of standards when it came to, um, you know, fire, the lack of mm -hmm. any type of firefighting, but the, the regulations of a school that we would never see today. Um, and this was one of the quotes that really kind of talked to you or talked to amplify both of your points about the lack of real um, purpose in their education. And this is on page 49. Practically everything they were taught in the schools that may be useful to them, they could learn better from their own people while living normal out of door lives. Mm -hmm. The domestic arts, which the girls were taught, are either those things they would have automatically learned if they were at home, such as sewing, or the things that would be useless to them later, such as baking cakes and pies. The manual training of the boys ranged from tending fishnets and cutting wood for the mission to painting in watercolors and weaving mats. Um, you know, and, and this, from this, the children must return to their families unfitted for the lives that they must lead. And then it was an RCMP that actually spoke of how crappy it was. And then one of the sisters was upset and kind of re rebutted him and said, um, not being dependent on education for earning a living is it only natural that the Indian boy appreciates less its benefit. But however, in most cases, after spending his five years in the school, can keep his own accounts and write letters better than uh, white trappers of this country who had more schooling outside the Indian boy receives in this country. And I just found that this quote was everything Canada. We don't care that we erased their their language, their culture, their land, that we separated and traumatized them from uh, their families. At least these children can do their freaking taxes and fill out those Canada tax Reve revenue agency forms. That's what my takeaway from that ridiculous quote was. And, um, and it's back to that whole conversation on language and the dehumanizing conversation about it and how often, you know, Eskimo and Indian, two words that I would say no settler should ever say ever. And that's just rampant throughout this entire book. Um, and, and, and it's hard because like um, the dehumanization of the Inuit into this, you know, Eskimo has caused um, like a lot of issues in so many ways. And I, I, I was thinking about, uh, I think her name is Kelly Frazier. She was a, like a 18 year old Inuit singer and she committed suicide. And one of her last retweets was that she wanted the Edmonton Eskimos to change their name. So when they finally mm -hmm. announced that they were going to, that was the one, um, Thing I was thinking about that I wish you could have seen but like the terminology is so dehumanizing I don't know how anyone who would be like for a terminology of an Eskimo could read this book and say yeah it was Eskimo is totally not a slur you know I just don't so and anyway Rosemary I'll pass it on to you First of all, you know, as you know, the book is like a PDF, so I didn't get it. But I looked up several other things on the internet, including 
an article by Crystal Fraser, whose PhD research was on residential schools in the North. And uh, she, she makes it really clear. <clears throat> And, and she also worked for the TRC. So I think a lot of what the TRC has in their report is probably coming from uh, some of her research. Um, but, you know, like we're, from our standpoint, we're looking at it and going, well, th this isn't education. How can they claim this is education? But really, they didn't intend to educate the children. You know, Fraser points out, just as with residential schools in the South, the whole idea was to remove children. They wanted to remove children from their families. They wanted to remove them from their traditional culture. They wanted to erase the language. And when it came to education, they weren't interested in anything beyond very, very basic skills or grades like, you know, basic writing and math skills. And that the labor that the children put in at these schools, right? Either, <clears throat> sorry, farming activities, the fishing, whatever, um, the girls in the, in the uh, school itself, it was all to maintain the school. It was like a self-perpetuating machine. And uh, so, so the purpose was never to educate the children. And <clears throat> there was one um, Google search link to an exhibition and the title of the exhibition was a quote from one of the um, survivors who testified before the TRC. Uh, and it was an exhibition of about eight different survivors, but the title was We So Far Away. So just to reflect back on what everyone else was saying, I mean, it was devastating for these children, absolutely devastating. <clears throat> and there was also an interesting um, piece by the Inuit Women's Association, and it was about um, violence, pre it was residential schools and violence prevention. But, you know, they, they really brought home, um, as did the other articles, the point that um, large numbers of children, uh, yes, missionaries ran schools before the 1950s, but it was in the, as you said, in the 1950s when <clears throat> the federal government starts putting in the money for these schools to run. And that's when more and more children, right, were being sent to the schools and forced to go to the schools. And that's relatively recent compared to the mid 1800s, right? And other parts of the country when that process, mid, mid to later 1800s when that process started. <clears throat> there were over, I think the Inuit Women's Association said there were close to something like 3,900 um, Inuit children who went through these schools. But because it was so recent, living today are still like at least 3,000 survivors from those schools. So the, the intergenerational trauma, I mean, it's, 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 yes, it's becoming intergenerational trauma, but it's also embodied within the people who actually went to those schools, it's still very fresh and, 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 and very new for people. And, it, and it's just played um, such havoc, right? Within the community, it's so present. And they also did a survey, <clears throat> almost half of people had a close, let's say the other people who didn't go, they had a close relative who did go, right? And that's where the, the trauma plays out. And uh, I kept thinking of, um, of you know, we read, we read the book, uh, The Right to be Cold, right, which is about the North, and it was trying to link things. And the Inuit Women's Association talked about the work that's being um, done today, right, to um, relearn culture, relearn language, and that there's a lot of the youth are really being encouraged to take leadership. And the key issue the youth are focused on is that issue of climate change, right? Which is talked about in the right to be cold so much. So I found all those points of, of connection uh, really, really important. Um, and I wish listening to you, I could have read the whole thing. Um, but I still feel like I got a lot from um, 
these articles, you know, at least in terms of an overview. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rosemary. I, I guess just to add to your point, Tom, page 14, educational goals were limited. Um, Henry Parkett uh, believed that young women, young girls needed little more knowledge of the Catholic um, other than the ability to read and write. Education was left in the Sisters of Charity. Uh, religious instruction took the form of ethics, um, Catholicism, um, music services and devotions. Mm -hmm. The hope that with such an education that the students would not stray from the church after leaving school. And I think that's the primary thing that we have to kind of yeah. really focus on that. Their, their goal, like you said, was hard labor and making sure they stayed as little Christians. Yeah. I, no right. matter how much you tell people that, I just don't think they understand it. But um, there was like kind of after that, they talk a lot about the treaty and how it kind of came to be, who, who paid for, for what? And interestingly enough, I just got um, an, uh, tagged in a, in, a, in a Twitter about today's education. And it says, uh, when averaging per student capital funding for the four metro school boards between 2013 and 2020, Calgary Catholic School Division received just under $7,000 per student compared to Edmonton, Catholic school district, which got 10,000 per, per student. Edmonton Public Board of Education is only getting just over 8,200. And the Calgary Board of Education receives the lowest at basically 6,600 per student. And I was, I, I just read this and they, and then I was looking at the numbers that they had here that they were competing for, um, you know, at one point in time, the propagation of faith sent 15,000 francs to the school in 1881 to save for Providence School. So my granny's school was on the verge of closing in 1881 because of a lack of money. And if it, it was actually the Métis parents that really wanted to keep that school open out of all things. Um, in 19, or in a, sorry, 1882, the Sisters of Charity at Fort Providence argued that the students were were made to spend too much time working and not enough in class so ironically even they're saying you know oh these kids are doing hard labor and we really need them in the class but we need funding and because there was no treaty nobody was no um provincial territorial or canadian government was going to give them any funding whatsoever and i'm just like and these kids were meant to starve um on the same page they say the conditions were no longer tolerable in the daytime, it wasn't too hard to find room for everyone, but at night it was pitiful, uh, though marvelous, to see how little ones were stowed away in regular lines, some of them on tables or in cupboards. Only one corner of the house was reserved for the sisters themselves. There were no potatoes, meat, flour, butter, or grease during the school's second year of operation. Like, th these conditions are absolutely intolerable. And it's, it's so ridiculous and people wonder why you know the need for catholic uh you know apologies etc uh so i guess we'll go shelly and kat um for my mind i need to connect things and i've seen this quote um and i think it really brings back to what we're talking about defender defenders of racist historical figures often sign cite the morals of the day and how they were you're muted Shelly I don't know how that happened no that's Sorry. okay no no did you did you hear any of it just start over okay Defenders of racist historical figures often cite the morals of the day and how they were just different Toward, however, they are usually talking about white people's morals. Black people always knew slavery was bad. Indigenous people always knew residential schools were um, genocidal. And I thought that was the per perfect quote. Like it was not, it was the colonial system that was bad. It wasn't, yeah. And that kind of, um, it, I need to have connect like connections. 
So in a lot of books that we've been read, like the last book, um, Until We Are Free, um, that talked about uh, Black Lives Matter and policing in Canada. And how, bring it back to what you were talking about, Michelle, and like kind of trying to separate. Um, and this happens in the disability community too. It's like, we'd be as marginalized people as being autistic and anything to do with the brain and disability. Oh, people just assume you're stupid. Um, is we're trying to separate each other, but we need to come together. And in the until we're free, they're talking about that people were black, but if you're black and Muslim, they separate you. And it's like, well, your religion or your, your race or your religion. It's like, well, can't we just be all together? Because if we fought together, we get so much further. And it made sense up in the north. Like we're just, we are, we may have different ideas, but we at the end of the day, we need each other to get move forward. And and then I think at the end, um, um at the end, somebody said, why are we fighting for the white people's scraps? Basically, they, the, it's like to, um, and it made sense. It's like, why are we, where we could just, um, I can't remember the quote, I have it tabbed, but it made sense. It's like, not why fight each other for what's left when we, sh when the global majority is not white. And, and I think that um, people that are, I'm not the, the mindset of working together. I don't want to say left, right. I just am not working together and not equality for all um, and redoing racist systems or systemic syst colonial systems. You need to realize that we get further when we work ahead or work together to fix things rather than work as separate. I think I'm making sense. I don't know. I don't ever want you to feel like you're not making sense here. I think your perspective is so valuable. Um, and I, I love that you bring to the table the intersectionality of um, disability and then talking about, um, you know, I, I hate the terminologies of so-called normal because what is normal? Um, and I, I just think that everything that you say helps uh, really bring that different lens to it as well. That's necessary and needed in this conversation and to kind of to add to what I heard from you is uh, I'm just flipping through some of the articles here of the uh, United Nation Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People because um, you know like article 15 yeah. says Indigenous people have the right to dignity diversity of their cultures traditions histor histories and aspirations that shall be properly reflected in education and public information and obviously that's what the TRC is and it goes far more into different ideas of of what um, education should be in some of the different articles right so I just yeah what you're saying absolutely makes sense and I think is a relevant part of this conversation in so many ways so I, I hope you know that's how we feel yep go ahead I just when somebody says normal I say normal is a setting on a dishwasher or a washing machine it's not a person <laughs> perfect perfectly said thank you so much Shelly and I don't have too much more um, to add. I think everybody really covered everything. Um, what also struck me is what you said in the beginning, Michelle, is how the North was pretty much ignored until resources were discovered. And then it was, yay, all, all in for capitalism. Um, plus the North's um, strategic locations. Um, which brought the American army to set up bases in the north. And uh, I can't remember where it is in the book, but um, <clears throat> at one point they had found American soldiers in the school, in people's, in young girls' beds. And it's like WTF, <laughs> that uh, that's really, 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 really wrong. And made me also think of the man camps that are based in north now and how a lot of Inuit and um, First Nations and Métis women are being exploited because of these resource-based um, uh, locations. So yeah, um, reading about residential schools, no matter how 
they are set up or who ran them there it's always really difficult and heartbreaking and every gd canadian should be reading about these and knowing about it and that's all i got to say mm, awesome cat kathy you have your hand up please don't hesitate to jump in Yeah, there was just um, one thing I forgot to talk about was the fact that that there is so much power because of the isolation of the North. Um, I forget if it was near the end of chapter five or chapter six, where they're talking about this. I, I'm going to mispronounce his name as Jekyll because it just makes me want to laugh, but um, how he basically ran almost all of the North. He had so many jobs, like the whole freaking Northwest Territories was run by one guy for like what a decade or something like it goes on for quite a while I was just like holy crap that's a lot of power to give to one person um and then there was the other guy the Mr. Finney um I forget what he was but you know like he seemed to be at least a little bit decent um tried to do the best that he could but was often shot down but yeah it was just like it just kind of blows my mind to, to think that one person can have so much power um, basically because the government didn't want to have to deal with being up north and the costs of running government up there so yeah that was something I forgot to talk about <laughs> no I'm glad you did and uh, actually Kat talked about um, the northern sovereignty issue as well and, um, and I remember very specifically it stating at one point in time in the TRC that uh, it was never about taking care of the people. It was only about sovereignty issues. And so ironically, um, for those, I, I don't know if I've told you all this, but I used to be a sea cadet when I was growing up in Sylvan Lake because there wasn't a whole lot to do in the winter unless you were a boy who played hockey. So there was a, a bus that left Penhold and it would pick up all of the farm kids and could stop in Sylvan Lake and then we'd go out to the Red Deer Armories. So I met a lot of, um, you know, central Alberta uh, farm kids and such. And um, one of the girls who worked, who lived in Red Deer, her father was an, an officer of our Sea Cadet Corps. And then she became an officer and she actually right now is up north breaking ice in her in her ship she's a commanding officer for one of the canadian ships she left halifax and she posted on her facebook some pictures of um you know them stopping and the polar bears like checking out their ship and like it, it's they're incredible pictures and uh you know it, I, I just inside of me all i'm thinking is we're at war with russia now <laughs> and uh you know she's in a really precarious a precarious a situation to be you know in a in a tiny ship really compared to other ships and and her job and mission is really to break up the ice and and you know i hate to say it but just be you know basically saying this is canadian sovereign land and it's so obvious throughout this book that was all they cared about was, you know, this is our land. And um, I don't know, it, it's, it's disgusting. I know that, like, uh, I don't remember reading much about the relocation of Inuit here too much. Um, I might not have got there, but I've read about it previously. And uh, knowing that they only moved them in order to maintain Canadian sovereignty, um, like so dehumanizing, you know, you you're basically going to be a ward of our state in this way. And that was only later when they realized that, uh, you know, the importance of it during the Cold War, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, there's no level of dehumanization when it comes to Indigenous in this country that hasn't been untouched, I think. And when you talked about the um, soldiers, like right away, I went to the MMIW um, report as well. So yeah, go ahead, Shell. I was just sorry I, I didn't want to interrupt you didn't go ahead okay um so what I was thinking is um about how some of the language has changed and Trevor Noah like I've come back to this it's about disabilities but it applies really well here the, the words have changed 
but how we are treated or how indigenous are treated has not changed. So it went from the R word to the short bus. I'm sure there's other words in between. And now it's DD, it's developmental delays. But if you don't change how you treat the people, it doesn't matter how, how, many, how many words you change, it's still gonna be, it needs to, the, the language needs to change, which is low hanging fruit. Also accompanied with how we are treated. Action. Especially with disabilities and with indigenous. And it comes, it, it's all connected because, yeah. Oh, I agree, Shelly. Yeah, go ahead. You're still muted, hon. I can't remember which article, but they pointed out that not only was it the residential school system that removed children from families, but children were also sent to TB sanatoria and would be there for years, far, far away. And, and I think that issue, again, was talked about in the right to be cold, right? How children, other family members sent south. You, nobody, sometimes they never knew what happened to their kids when they, when they were taken away. And, and then I was thinking of another book we we read in um, Kat's book club, um, and it was a, a book of, uh, it was like a, a photographic essay <clears throat> going across Canada, including, you know, Indigenous photographers, other photographers that lived in the communities and were close. And, and one of the themes running through when it came to discussions around the North was that, that um, many of these photographs were taken during a time of rapid social change. And um, again, one of these articles talks about the fact that because parents didn't want to be so far removed from their children, and because these schools would be set up in little communities, families would, would leave, right? And their um, you know, traditional patterns of hunting, trapping, gathering, using the land, and settle in these communities which further contributed to social change in terms of what was going on in people's lives. So there are just many different aspects of this that were so, you know, destructive. Right, it was awful. Uh, Kathy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on the, uh, the TB. Um, plugging that separate beds again, a book by Maureen Lux. Um, it, it was really distressing for me when I read that book about how a lot of the Northern kids would just disappear. They would, they would send up a, a boat to do tuberculosis x-rays. Um, kids would go onto the boat and never be seen again. They'd be taken away to the South here and the South basically used them to make money. Um, they would be like, oh, a, a hospital in Ontario didn't have enough funding because it was per capita in the, in the sanatorium. So they would ask like people down here in the prairies, do you have any TB patients you can send our way? Um, maybe next year we'll be able to send you some or, but it was a lot of the Northern kids that would come from, from you know, the Northwest Territories and they'd end up being shipped to Ontario or places that like, and. I just found when I read that book how hard it must have been for these uh, people up north to to lose their kids that way. They wouldn't even let them leave the the boats to say goodbye to their parents. They would just like go in there for an X-ray and just be taken away, never to be seen again. Who knows where? Their parents couldn't even track them down because they went to oh, they're sending them to Edmonton to Charles Council, but then they're not there. If their parents actually had a chance to get there to look for them, their kids got shipped someplace over in Ontario because you know they needed some some more money. You know, um, I found that really disturbing how how um, how the northern people were treated so poorly like i mean all indigenous people were treated poorly in the sanatoriums but um especially the north northern people i think they really suffered because of the great distances and um and yeah i, I that just when i read that part of the book i was just like wow um i guess that's about all i had to say just you know when she's when she's talked about <laughs> tuberculosis and stuff i was just like Wow, yeah, the North really suffered the people up north just because of the the lack of health care and the vast 
vastness of it that the people there suffered so much more I think than than the people down here in 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 a lot of ways thanks you know one of the reasons why I enjoy chatting with you all is because you've all seen the huge shift in technology from today compared to before and I can tell you in 1994 uh, when I had graduated high school and I was trying to figure out between Indian Affairs in Ottawa and um, my band up in Yellowknife um, what education funding looked like and both being absolutely not interested in talking to a 17 year old squaw from uh, Alberta that I just um, paid how much in you know fees to Alberta government telephones at the time AGT like I'd have to save um, $50 to make a phone call, one phone call that usually meant nothing because there wasn't, you know, one 800 numbers or anything. And I mean, this is in 1994. So I can't imagine what it would be like up north knowing your child is gone and you have zero avenues to find out where your kid is. And especially in the thirties or twenties or anything like that. Like I can't even, comprehend that there's been nothing good come from indian affairs other than pain suffering genocide and and land theft like it there's nothing good and like i'm seeing tweets today and i was kind of reflecting on how you'd never see anything like that especially when you read some of the quotes that come out of the this particular book um when it comes to ottawa and such and you know that again back to that dehumanizing language of you know indian uh eskimo or um what well, i can't remember what they called the so-called white kids but uh and that was just their attitude yeah go ahead rosemary if you just unmute yourself unmute yourself i can't hear you <laughs> i just want to build on what you're saying michelle i mean i think it's such a reflection of, of white supremacy and, and how it operates. Um, and I was thinking about that when Wendy was talking and then when you were talking now and, and everybody, what everyone's had to say. And I, 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 I honestly think that um, everyone from the government to the missionaries to others, they, they, indigenous peoples were less than, right? They weren't, if you could imagine, if any of us should be able to imagine putting ourselves in the shoes of someone whose child is being taken away. But I don't think that ever happened because somewhere in that white supremacist mindset was the idea that, that human feelings weren't the same, right? That, that, we, that, that families didn't have the same emotional connections, right? That white families did. I mean, it's abhorrent, but anyway, that's 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 where I think we come right back to the racism and the white supremacy. And yeah. all the pol yes, the policies were terrible, but what's the thinking behind these policies above and beyond, yeah, access to resources, sovereignty, and the rest? It's because people are not being read as, as human, as equals, as, as deserving of how. What, how we'd want anyone to be treated. Oh, it's so agreed. Uh, Shelly, I know you have your hand up and I hope you can keep that thought here for a second and just kind of build on what Rosemary was talking about. Like, you know, um, the large hostiles, page 129, um, they talked a little bit about December of 1974, uh, June 1972, um, one of the residential schools in 1966, like this is literally the time that my um, aunts and uncles lived there and we're going through this. And and I when I read how they spoke about it, you know, heavy workload and low wages led to constant turnover. The resignation of the supervisors of, and I don't know how to say this word, but I've seen it all the time, uh, at Cho Hall uh, in 1966 with Hawkins, the administrator for the McKenzie district to observe during the past two years, we have plagued with a steady turnover of staff at this hall for long periods, having operated without adequate staff. Given the wages that were being offered, it was almost impossible to recruit and hold people with minimum 
qualifications, let alone those who are qualified as we feel that they should be. Um, he feared that we may, may shortly face a situation where it will be impossible to operate at all. And I just like, here's the thing. I don't know how my one uncle became an engineer and how my one aunt became a lawyer, but these were the conditions that they were growing up in. You know, they didn't go to this hall, but this is right, right across the lake from them. And um, I just, I read this and I mean, it says also like to this day, teachers who can't find jobs in the like regular system, they still go to, um, you know, reserves to get teaching experience and they get paid less. And then they're put into these, you know, uh, culturally inappropriate places without any cultural training as well. And, um, and, and I just, I, I cannot wrap my brain how my aunt, my uncle managed to do what they did. I just can't because it just doesn't make any sense. And my mom, she at that time was um, given a short grant to come to state and, and learn business administration, which she did. But when it ran out of funding, she was done. And she had met my dad by that time and gotten pregnant. So knocked up with me. So, you know, and I, I just think about that time of how wild that must have been for them to be going through this experience and then being in the end so successful as a lawyer and as an engineer, et cetera, et cetera. But um, yeah, go ahead, Shelly. I think what, what okay, what, how was I trying to, okay. What I was trying to say is my experiences and the more that I learn through the book clubs and the uh, advocacy with the reconciliation group and the reading I do and advocacy in the disability world has led me, because I am a caseworker in the disability world, has led me to the caseworker I am and how supportive of families I can be um, within the rules. I have to stay within legislation. But the more I read, it's the, it's like, and please tell me if I'm wrong, because this I, I'm trying to make sense of it myself, is that sometimes some people think that people, it's like a, what am I trying to say? Can I come back to that? Because I think yeah. it's, but I do think what yeah. your point is, sometimes you just need to kind of chat with somebody about it. And yeah, um, and I th yeah. go ahead. I think it's where I'm coming from and what I've been reading, because we've read a lot of stuff that's kind of about this, is that people then and people now think that they're above people and nobody's above anybody. Or, and um I had a conversation, I had to call someone out and said, because they called somebody a burden. I'm like, no one individual is a burden, maybe as a whole society and a whole population, whole human race were a burden to the, the earth, but not one individual is on a burden. Um, or Mother Earth would say that we're all a burden. But anyways, but not one individual person. You can't say that. No one is like, in my mind, I want, um, everyone has their own story. And I want... I'll never see it in there, but I want to try to fight for everyone to have equal access. And um, but it, and try to do better because it what has gone on is not right. And what is going on is not right with the slippery slope with eugenics um, and in the disability community and that, and people are like, well, Shelly, why are you talking about this? Because it starts somewhere. Uh, what happened in Germany started somewhere. And with what, ha and what happened in Canada started, it started somewhere small. It started, and I see, yeah, exactly. It starts small and then it gets huge. And, and if you don't realize it, and if you don't talk about the past and say, this is going to happen again, if we don't deal with it, I'm not saying about to be, we, shame's not where I'm going. We need to educate and try to build a better future. And when, um, I know I can be angry and upset, but I think I'm trying to help do better. And I always want to try to do better in the background because being a cis white female, 
I want to be the backer. Like right now, as we're talking, I'm fixing the lists and helping with for the website. So, but that's what I'm doing is because I don't want to be the voice of anything, maybe autism, because women in autism is I'm not the poster child of autism. Um, but I don't want to be, I, I want to be in the background because that's where I like to be. I um or one-on-one -on -one or a small group. Um, but everybody needs to do their part. And nobody is a burden. And I think that's what happened is that people th thought they're better than people and nobody's better than anybody. You know, Shelly, um, I didn't want to be an activist. I didn't want to ever do a protest. I didn't want to be a leader on a book club. And I know you don't want to be the poster girl for autism. But at the end of the day, we're kind of pushed into these positions. And I, I, it, obviously our ancestors know we have the strength to do it. We shouldn't have to, but we are doing it. And you're sitting at boards and such that you have to because you have your real life experience in the current systems that we have. So I, I, I know it's sometimes hard to make peace of why, but it just is. And your real life lived experience is really valid. And especially right now, um, especially right now in a pandemic. And I think because all of us here understand science and history and data and try to listen to like reality as opposed to Fox News, you know, you have a, a group of people that understand exactly what you're saying about how anyone who's ever um, studied eugenics and seen how people are categorized as lesser right now are at the highest risk because of poor government policies at every order of government, not just like provincially, not just to pick out the losers of the losers, but you know, all of the different orders are uh, placating these anti-mask bullies that are racist, uh, white supremacist, eugenics believing buffoons. And you people like myself, our whole community is at high risk. So, you know, my daughter gets the flu bug and I'm at level 10 out of 10, like, oh shit, what's gonna happen? Like. You have every right to feel triggered, upset, and seeing the multi-layeredness of this and how eugenics was deeply rooted in Indian residential schools and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the dehumanizing language that's in here. Like, it's all relevant and all matters and your perspective really matters. And that's why I'm grateful you're here. Thank you. And it just, it gets me so angry. Um, they're trying to make uh, a test for autism to see if they can find it in utero. I have a right to exist. Yeah. And, and, and all, you know, ref refugees come in all different colors. And, uh, you know, we just have to, and somebody can become a refugee at any time just have to be open and loving and hope in our hearts because I even know it's a stupid yeah a stupid movie that day after tomorrow it could happen to us it's a real reality and I haven't shown it to Sam but kind of back to your point about refugees like ultimately the indigenous people never believed that it is our right to exclude people and fundamentally I think that that has to be at like our core here right where um even as an indigenous person my voice may have been silenced silenced for years but you know we're trying to work through this i think we have the right solutions like to to work with but obviously you know working through it's going to take time energy policy all that stuff but you know it, it i just hope you know how how it's all interconnected and related and then um with the intergenerational trauma leading into um, autoimmune disorders and, and such that we, we see today, like 
legitimate physical health issues as a result of this sh these awful um policies like it, it is all interconnected and um you know my people have the right to proper health care but we've been denied it it's 2000 you know 22 and we're still denied health care so and that goes against treaty the intention of treaty was for us to be equal there's no question so that's why um whether it's a stupid protest that happened on saturday or long-standing historical issues like it's all interconnected and it matters so i hope you feel like your voice matters here too governments need to stop this pissing match like oh it's this person this person. no just get the done like and figure out like if it's if it's a basic human right figure out who pays for it in the end that's fine that's down the road but if somebody's hurt or someone needs help figure out the payment later but just get it done like i don't get it um maybe that's just my brain but like if somebody needs some thing like it shouldn't be like oh it's inac or it's h or it's like this it's just like or it's the health l l a h s doesn't matter who paid for it just get it done and then the pencil uh, paper pushers can figure out that later they have the time somebody's health is more important than a dollar or two like it's that, okay that's not what i'm like not the money like paper people who push paper have more time than somebody's health like the dignity of health and the dignity of being taken care of is more important and the long-term care what our systems have thing who pays for it in the end whether like in Jody Wilson's Raybol's book, The Indian in the Cabinet, is so we need to take care of the party systems because they've done us no good. And she was talking about people running on individual and running on what they actually do. And that is so correct because then we would elect them on what they've done, not what plat party platform. And then when we they go to reelect, they'd actually try to get stuff done instead of just push up a, a party platform. You know, if you really like this, um, really like that book, which we haven't read, yeah. and we want it in our one of our book clubs coming up. Um, I wanted to point this out. Um, I had actually done a conversation about UNDRIP for International Women's Day with the Liberal Party. And I, I brought up this book called Tragedy, Tragedy in the Commons. Um, former members of Parliament speak out about Canada's failing democracy. And um, it's a 2014 book. And um, so I had read it before we even uh, became government in 2015. So I bring it up because I a lot one of the questions that people asked me about on drift was, you know, what what are some of the um, uh, issues that we are having with implementing on drift? And I would just point blank said uh, Canadian politics. You know, like we have a society that, um, and we watched for three weeks in Ottawa all these orders of government talk about jurisdictional um, problems. Literally Saturday and today, we're still dealing with the jurisdictional problems of policing compared to the city, compared to bylaw, you know, because these folks can't just work together and get it figured out. So, you know, how is how are Indigenous leaders supposed to have equal voice at all of these different orders of government all these different tables if we're not even included to begin with let alone seen as equal voices right so um you may find that book really um kind of amplifying what jody is saying in a in a different way that really shows the problems with canadian politics and i i you know i'll write said party um we campaigned in 2015 on uh eliminating the first past post system and we couldn't figure it out enough to do that. So of course on drip is being um, you know, at every jurisdiction having these problems where, you know, you have hostile governments like conservative led provinces that are just hostile to it. And with the exception of Vancouver, there's no municipalities that have really implemented on drip. So um, so you have all these jurisdictional um, fights when it comes to implementation of this one document. So of course that's the bigger picture of the shortcoming when it comes to indigenous education. Um, you have all these orders of government fighting over jurisdiction, and then you have these boards that are like, we're not racist, but my kid's not safe enough to be in their system, right? So we have a lot of problems. And um, I think eugenics is a conversation that's totally relevant considering um, Indian residential or Indian hospitals weren't 
um, really there for natives to get better. They were really there for natives to get sick and they, they didn't get the same proper care of uh, white hospitals, right? So it, it's just, there's so many levels of an, of an ugly onion to unlayer and look at the root problem. Uh, interesting how an onion has a root. Anyway, you guys better stop me. Somebody better chime in here before I keep talking. Um, um, I, I'm so, oh, sorry, Kat, I talked too much. You go. I just wanted to talk about um, how I, I could never understand. My mother died of breast cancer. She never saw the doctor until it was the size of a baseball, basically. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, Kat, I didn't see your hand was up. Okay. Um, but it wasn't until I, I, uh, I read that separate beds and I really started to understand that the healthcare system was never there to help indigenous people. It was there for people to just go die. And then, and you only did that if you were in severe pain, because then you were not surrounded by your family. So, um, yeah, that was that was a hard thing to, to learn because I, I got separated from my mom because the Canadian government in their wisdom gave me to a 60 year old pedophile to be raised instead of being raised by my 35, 40 year old mother. Um, so I never really got to know her, but you know, like I met her twice and then she died of this cancer and I could never understand what took her so long, what took her so long to go to the hospital. Um, but yeah, you know, like educating yourself by reading all these books is important because um, it just makes you reflect on the things that have happened in your life and it, and it helps you to understand. So, you know, formal education is not everything. Being part of book clubs um, and learning on your own is, is a very legitimate way to learn and grow. Oh, Thank I agree, you, Kathy. No, I'm, I appreciate you saying that. And interestingly enough, I did a poll on Twitter and uh, my friend asked, uh, you know, two truths and a lie. And people had to guess what the lie was. And my lie was I had a, a degree from the UFC. And everybody thought that was the truth. That was like my number one truth. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. And it, that was what one of the comments were when I, I revealed. I'm like, no, this is a lie. And you all thought it was the truth. And someone said, just goes to show how, um, you know, self-education can uh, really further you. So just to amplify what you're saying. I can't believe you met your husband at what, four years old or grade four or whatever it was. <laughs> I actually have a really cute black and white picture of us together. And, cool. you know, I think I look ridiculous and I think he looks so cool. And we're sitting, because we had crushes on each other then. So we were like in line together. But then when somebody called us out, we had this whole thing in the sandbox, actually, it's for real happened, where our uh, one guy came over and was like, do you like him or what? And I'm like, you know, uh, he had answered the question, well, no. And we had been hanging out in the sandbox for like every day together for like a week, I clearly had a crush on each other. So when I was asked, I was like, no. And I got up and stomped off and walked over to the garbage bin. And just when nobody could see me, I cried. That for real happened. And then <laughs> he said that he never did really like dated and was afraid of girls because of what happened with me. So when we were connected <laughs> when he was 18 and I was 16, it was, it was one of those funny lies. I denied even remembering it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oh, so crazy. I know. Um, Kat. That's adorable. <laughs> and Kathy, I'm really sorry about about your mom and uh, what happened with her. Um, I just wanted to say maybe something revolutionary, like we should change our government. We should abolish our government, set up a new system that includes, I have this dream, indigenous people. Um, yeah, no, exactly. Do a, I think set, we should set up a council like Switzerland has, which has representatives rather than um, a prime minister. And there would be two indigenous people on it, two English people, two French people, and then um, a, a, a third, um, the last person to 
break the tie in case there um, are tie breaks. But anyway, um, that's something I've been dreaming about would be just abolishing our British based government and just doing it over, starting over and including Indigenous people, not giving them a um, power, but letting them claim their power. Not letting, I'm saying it all wrong. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, no, I, I know what you know mean, like our inherent rights to govern ourselves exactly. and, and exactly. for self-determination. And, you know, um, the treaty said we would work together. And at no point since they have come here, have we done that? So to me, I'm right there with you. And that was kind of my argument when it came to um, on DRIP was that, you know, we need to reimagine uh, outside the Westminster system because yeah. all we care about is liberals or any other political mm -hmm. party is the next election. That's all we care about, that data mining for the next election and making sure, you know, we check the polls and we strategize. And when we know we're going to win, we call the election. Yeah. You know, um, that is poor governance at the end of the day, because I, in our ways, we think seven generations, right? And we don't have that. And I remember Romeo Dallaire, I was lucky enough to see him here in Calgary speak. And he talked about how he admired having a 200 year goal that you, you know, regularly update and talk about as a society and make sure it's on par. And I was, and then I told him, well, as Indigenous people, we have, you know, we think seven generations. And that's, what we need to do together. And you could see like he was totally on board with that at the time. Um, but to get all of Canada to understand like, you know, the importance of, you know, a, a 200 year goal, a hundred year goal, a 50 year goal. But that's a really hard conversation to have when your country just celebrated 150 years, right? <laughs> and a lot of Canadians really struggle with their identity. And ironically, all these so-called freedom fighters have really made it so a lot of folks look down on the Canadian flag. Um, like I've had many settlers tell me that they don't have uh, patriotism now because of them. And I, I get really offended by that because I'm like, oh, so all the graves around the schools, that's, that's not a good enough reason for you to be offended by the flag. But uh, no, it took the freedom fighters being loud and obnoxious for them to not like him anymore, so. Anyway, geez, it's already like we have five minutes to wrap up here. So maybe I'll just go um, Wendy, Rosemary, Kathy, Kat, and Shelly, and we'll just do a, a kind of a lasting thought here before we wrap up. And I will grab uh, Bert Snow. Oh, I had it right here. All right. So our, our next book club is Bert Snow, just so everybody knows. Great. Um, and really good discussion, lots to think about. I think, um, you know, I, I think about this quite a lot. How do we get to a better place than we are now? And I, I think the hard part, like you said, Michelle, how do we get all of Canada thinking about um, big, difficult things in a direction that all goes together? I, I think a lot of it comes down to a lot of people have really limited awareness of why we're where we are. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what I take away and how I get through my days. It's like, well, you know, these, these conversations matter and trying to have them with family and, and people we care about, um, in small ways, um, I think is, is what I can see right now in my own generation, but definitely going to take away lots of thoughts around reflection. And we came up with lots of stories today on how this book can actually connect to lots of other directions. And so I think that's what I'm taking away is really how do I, how do I keep connecting this? So when it's a conversation about something totally different, we kind of get back to these same goals coming up. Awesome, thanks so much, Wendy. And thanks for coming as always. Rosemary. Yeah, I just wanted to build on what Kat said. Instead of us setting something up and including two Indigenous, two French, two English. I think the whole thing could be turned over to the Indigenous peoples of this land and, and the values and principles em em embedded in culture to, to create something, to, to create the, a system we, we could all live under. That would be amazing. I agree. That would be amazing. I'm, I would be happy to, to just hand it all over to Indigenous folks. Please, please. 
take it. And this is our next uh, book club, Burnt <laughs> Snow by Kieran Moore. Awesome. Kathy, do you have any last things? Um, I've just uh, been wondering about, uh, worried about the governments right now, because I, from what I understand, when COVID hit, I was worried that they'd be trying to do underhanded things. And from what I'm understanding, they're having meetings with select people from the AFN, and they're in the process of trying to dismantle the, the Indian Act and, and creating levels of government for indigenous people that are like municipalities and mm -hmm. and they're doing their consultations all behind board like they're not doing it out in the open they're doing it through uh covid zooms you know like because of covid they're zooming all these people or whatever and i'm like so that's a big fear that all of a sudden they're going to announce that there's the 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 red paper number two is coming out or the white paper number two is coming out right like I, I'm just, I'm just worried that right now that there's some underhanded stuff going on, on and I'm worried about our uh, political future. Um, I, I feel like instead of getting better for First Nations people, it's going to be um, made worse by, by another Trudeau. That's all I have to say, thanks. <laughs> all right. Anybody else? Um, I think this is, it's been a tough little while because I've also had to deal with uh, some ableism. I've been, this is the first time I've ever held anybody to account on how I feel or what, how they made me feel. Um, it's coming, kind of wrapping up. So I'm kind of working on coming back. I've been doing stuff, but I've been like more in the background. Um, it's been tough. It's been a tough few months, um, but it, it keep going and just take enough self care. Um, and I think it's just to work at it your own pace because this will consume you. Um, and about going back to education, I do have the, the formal education. However, saying that, I have learned more by my by reading and listening to people, being open and uh, having open, honest conversations with people than I learned from my formal education. They're just pieces of paper right now. I've learned more from people in uh, marginalized communities than I have learned from my uh, colonial master's level course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, program. All right. Well, thanks everybody for having another wonderful book club. I'm so grateful that you all made space to come and were able to come. And I'll probably upload this video so that folks who may want to um, participate can. And yeah, don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, later on if you need to. And I hope you enjoy Burnt Snow as well. And we'll go from there. Thank you. All right, folks. Take care. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thanks. Everybody.